Hello and welcome to Painless Universal, a conversation with myself and Welsh. Today I am absolutely excited to be talking to Dr. Amr Zedi. For those who don't know him, he's a pediatric hematology doctor, doctor and he's been looking after sickle cell patients for many, many years. What inspired me to reach out to Dr. Ahmed was his love, his care, and the notice of the gap of the differences in treatment for people with sickle cell disease. And like many other people would do, they would just ignore that. He did not, he chose not to. He chose to become vocal about the serious issue affecting people like myself with sickle cell anemia. He decided to speak up for it, about it and also do a TEDx show where he openly talked about what sickle cell is, the complication of sickle cell and why it's ever so important that everyone understands this issue. I am so happy he's come, he has accepted my invitation to come and talk about these difficulties affecting people like myself living with sickle cell disorder and why today, not tomorrow, more than ever, people need to take people who live with sickle cell, their pain seriously. Meet Dr. Amma. And welcome again to Painless Universal, a conversation with myself and Welsh. I, as I said in the introduction, I am really delighted to have Dr. Amma here with me. Dr. Amma, where are you based today? Where are we joining me from? So I'm in Detroit, Michigan, in the United States. Okay. Um, and uh, you know we we just got through our first snow, so I'm uh, kind of wishing that I wasn't here, but but here we are. You see, different worlds, and we are wishing that we could get some snow here in London, England. We're just <laughs> hoping that this could be just a little bit of white winter, but obviously I don't doubt it will happen. But we will never we can never stop wishing. Um, Fair enough. I had to reach out to you and on a serious note, I've seen your, I think the very first time you came to my um, existence was a tweet, a tweet that you posted. And that just got me when I read that. I'm like, wow, someone else thinks in the same pattern and same mannerism like I do. And I was really delighted and I'll share that tweet with everyone. Um, so you guys will see this tweet that really, really got me. But before we get into that, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself so people could understand your journey of who you are. Yeah, so I, um, I'm a Canadian. I was born in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, and um, that's the border, the border city to Detroit, Michigan, where I am right now. I, um, I grew up in a uh, really liberal home. My dad was a professor of political science and um, his job actually was, um, he was the race relations officer for, for the government of Ontario um, in our province. So from a young age, we would have really open conversations about race and culture and the strong belief that people are more alike than different. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, thankfully grew up in a really multicultural setting uh, with, uh, with a lot of uh, friends of you know, different varieties. Um, but the, 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 the day my life kind of changed was about five years ago. Five years ago, I, um, I, had, I had done something which is called an implicit bias test. I had, I had wanted to check myself for my own biases. And when I got the results of that test back in, it told me that I had a slight bias favoring white patients. And that, that shook me to the core. Yeah. As a minority myself, mm -hmm. who grew up in this liberal home with friends of all different colors, races, and cultures, mm -hmm. I was a victim of mainstream media, mm -hmm. socialization, society, the subtle cues that make us look at people of color even ourselves as substandard. That was eye-opening for me. And then recognizing the position of power that physicians have dealing with vulnerable patients. 
it's no different than a police officer and someone he's trying to take down, right? It's the same vulnerability. It's the same power dynamic. So to me, as a physician of sickle cell patients who were mostly black, there was no chance that I could let this bias go unchecked. And recognizing that it's not something that I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to be biased. I'm not trying to be prejudiced. It's just the way we're sort of, sort of raised and socialized. But I think I started paying attention, right? I recognized my own blinder, my blind spot, and I started paying attention to that blind spot. And, and that's when things changed. And that's what helped me recognize blind spots that others have too. And, and, and maybe helping them recognize that they have some blind spots that, that they need to pay attention to. You're a hematology doctor. And I am. And pediatric. What made you, what led you on that path? And especially one of the key focus was sickle cell. What led you on that path? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I, um, I pretty quickly realized that I didn't want to be an adult doctor. Um, you know, adults are tough. They're tough. They're challenging. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a kid at heart. You know, I, 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 I like spending time with, with kids. I think they, they keep us young. They keep us hopeful. So I knew pretty early in my medical career that I wanted to work with children. And then I made sort of the realization that I wanted to take care of kids who were sick. Um, but I didn't want to see them only when they're sick. I wanted to see them when they're well, too. And then I met, um, you know, a, a teacher of mine um, who convinced me that hematology was, was a good career choice. And um, in 1999, actually, my sister uh, had her firstborn, my, ne my nephew. Uh, she called me and said, I was in high school at the time. Mm -hmm. She called me and said, his newborn screen came back positive. He has sickle cell trait. And I said, wait a minute. That, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen to people from Pakistan and India, does it? Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very naive question of a, of a high school student at the time, right? And um, that led me down a rabbit hole. I was like, wow, this is a big problem in India and Pakistan too. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had the fortune of going to medical school in the West Indies. Mm -hmm. I got to see sickle cell disease up close. Um, and I got to see sickle cell disease being treated in a place with no resources. Mm -hmm. What they had was a lot of compassion. Yeah. Then I came here to the United States and saw all the resources, all the treatment, blood transfusion, the PCAs, the opioids, but no compassion. And it was shocking to me. Um, and that's, that's sort of when I was like, you know what? Uh, being a doctor is tough, but even if I'm not a doctor, I could, I could be proud of standing up for patients that are being victimized. That's something that is worth doing. That's something that should be somebody's nine to five. Um, and that's kind of how I ended up here. Wow. You know, I, you are doc, one of the doc, uh, doctors for sickle cell at your hospital. But before I even get to it, because I think people watching this will like to understand more, I always talk about sickle cell. But one other thing I very always miss out is what is sickle cell? and how painful from your experience as a doctor could you describe sickle cell? Because yeah, I could say from a patient point, point of view and people was like, okay, she's yeah. just saying it. But could you just tell us a little bit about what is sickle cell for any of us, but any of those watching it, watching this right now, who's going to watch yeah. it, to just help them understand and the severity of sickle cell. Sure. So the red blood cell is, um this magnificent little unit. Um, it's a disc-shaped, smooth little cell that um, if you broke down your body into individual pieces, into Legos, two thirds of it would be red blood cell. And that's because it's the most important, it, it, its function is the most important function in the body. It's the reason you're breathing. You're breathing so that your red blood cells can get oxygen and deliver oxygen. It's literally the essence of life. And just in the last minute that me and you have been talking, we made 2.5 million red blood cells in our body. Okay. This is 
this is truly the life-giving unit of our, of our lives. And within each of those red blood cells, the thing that makes it red is something called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is what holds on to oxygen. It's like an oxygen delivery truck. What happens in patients with sickle cell disease is their red blood cells have a problem where when oxygen comes off of red blood cells, hemoglobin starts sticking to itself. When it sticks to itself, it forms these long strings that we call polymers. And that changes the shape of the red blood cell. And it changes it into like a knife shape, which we call a sickle. It's a crescent moon. And this is a huge problem because the red blood cells function is dependent on its ability to change shape. Because as it goes through this highway network of blood vessels, it needs to be able to change size and shape. But when it's sickled, it can't, and it gets stuck. And what happens is, is you get inside of this blood vessel, you get a traffic jam. You get sickle cells and white blood cells and platelets that all stick together and block blood flow. Now, if you think about the pain, what's happening here is when this traffic jam forms and blood flow is obstructed, the pain that's being felt is the pain of the strangulation of tissue. On May 25th of this year, George Floyd 20 times told a police officer, I can't breathe. And what I'm saying to you is sickle cell disease is just another form of I can't breathe. Mm. It's oxygen not being delivered, right? And that's exactly the pain that sickle cell patients feel. It's I can't breathe. It's not, it's not physically breathing, but it's oxygen not being delivered to their bones and their muscles and their tissues. And that's a pain that only somebody with sickle cell disease can explain to you, which is why often you, you sense that sickle cell patients often feel closer to other sickle cell patients than they do their families. Um, because nobody else gets it. And there's no words that can explain it. And there's no labs that can explain it. There's no blood work. There's no heart rate. There's nothing that can explain that pain. And we've simplified it to how bad is your pain on a scale of zero to 10, right? And for such a complicated thing, it's criminal mm. that the only way we can measure it is by giving it a number between zero and 10. That's, I guess, the, the best explanation I can give you of sickle cell disease in my estimation. Yeah, no, um, that is one of the most, you know, illustrative, not in a cartoon form, but anyone listening to this, I think they will absolutely grab and understand immediately what is it that we go through? Or what is it exactly that is sickle cell? Because myself, I struggle to explain it to people because for me, I'm just focused. When, when you ask me, and all I say to you is I'm in pain, I can't talk anymore. I'm just in pain, get me the drugs. I just need a relief. Right. And one of the things I find with sickle cell is what you've just mentioned in the last bit is that I go in, the first thing that do, they will ask me on a scale of one to 10, what is your pain? And Honestly, people don't get that, that that is even more painful. That question in itself is now adding to the pain because you are right. I was having this discussion and I was thinking about this, you know, when it's diabetes or other thing, high blood pressure, for example, you could check the thing and you say the high blood pressure is high, you say, go take medicine. Yeah, you are Mr. Smith or Mr. Whatever, you have a high blood pressure. Diabetes, you could click and you could say, yeah, you have this. Sickle cell, you're just ju ju judging me based on what I tell you. And because what I tell you in times of pain might just be screaming 1,000, I said one, then you're looking at me as a doctor. Most doctors will look at you and think, I just asked you zero to 10. And in my mind, I can't think of zero to 10. All I could think of is that this thing is so bad and I can't get myself around it. And I just love the way you've just described that until we get that thing where we can actually say 
patient A has come into hospital, let's measure how much pain that person is. There will always be this gap. And especially because the people with sickle cell, majority of us are black. And you're right about that. You are very vocal. And I love this about you, that you go out there and you talk about, you tweet about pain. What you now led you on this path to start talking about the pain you see people like myself suffering and why you felt it was important that more awareness was raised? You know, America is uh, a little bit unique, right? In America, the sickle cell patient the origin of the sickle cell patient is as a direct result of the transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. And then this healthcare system built itself on the back of African slaves by mistreating them and using them as subjects to, you know, study and not humans. And time and time again has failed the black community um, in so many ways uh, by proving that they're not important because of the color of their skin. That extra layer of complexity that comes from being a disease that's here as a direct result of the slave trade, there's no other disease process that can be defined in, in the same way. And to me, seeing children with sickle cell disease being judged by people who I respected, colleagues, mentors, other physicians, people who share the craft of medicine with me, it was very difficult. And um, when you're young and a trainee, um, you don't feel necessarily comfortable discussing these things, but at some point your silence becomes criminal, right? At some point enough is enough. And, and, and at that point you really have to stand up for the patient. And I think what happened is there was a switch that went off in, in my head. Um, I, I'm not, I'm no longer worried about my colleague or my trainee or my hospital being comfortable. I, I, I'm very, very happy making them uncomfortable so that my patient is comfortable. The comfort of the patient is my priority. And that's the attitude that I was missing for a long time. Uh, but the more I interacted with these patients and you know, with pediatric patients, you really grow close to them. You watch them grow up and you see how they change and their personalities. And as a sickle cell physician, I get to see them when they're not in the hospital. I get invited to their birthday parties and their football games. And I get to hear about their graduations. And they're people, they're people. And until my colleagues around the world start looking at sickle cell physicians like people, and not patients with a disease that defines them, I'm gonna keep being loud about it um, because there's, we've just, it's, this is the biggest tragedy in medicine that we have. Thank you for that. I really appreciate you, you being, you speaking on our behalf because I think the more doctors come out there to talk about it, it would just make it a lot more real and, and you know, give us more understanding that and also increase the survival rate of sickle cell as well, because I think when a patient is too scared to talk about their issues, that delays, causes delays. <laughs>